of this series, we've seen a gradual shift in the relationship between Britain and its former colonies in Australia. As the century has progressed, our political system has come to be independent of Britain's, and we've taken our own place in the international community. The single formal link that remains is that we share a monarch. There's considerable debate about exactly when the Australian political system became fully independent of Britain. The question has troubled constitutional lawyers for years. It's not simply an obscure legal debate, because our relationship with Britain influences our dealings all over the world. Although Federation of the Australian Colonies in 1901 was a dramatic event along the path to independence, the political ties to Britain remained tight. I think the main characteristic of the Constitution is that it reflects its origins, that is, that it's a compromise, and a, a compromise that was difficult to achieve at the time, but a compromise between six colonies to establish not a union, not a, a single nation state, but a, um, a limited federation. And it has the other characteristic that it has nothing to do with uh, independence. The Federation Fathers, it's clear from their debates, uh, assumed independence some time, but not in their time. Uh, one or two of them were even Republicans, but again, they didn't make a, a great issue of it. That's not what the Constitution was about. Six colonies decided for good reasons that they needed common activities in certain areas, defence being the obvious one. Uh, and that also to be useful to have a, a single policy on something like tariff uh, or free trade. The relationships of the colonies, even though they would now be called states, with London remained exactly the same. They had exactly the same uh, colonial constitutions dating from earlier in the 19th century. All that happened was now there was an extra entity called the Federation. Australia took a further step towards independence when, under Prime Minister Billy Hughes, it joined the newly formed League of Nations after the First World War. Until then, Australia's foreign policy had been largely dictated by Britain. But the freedom Britain gave its dominions was limited. The British government retained significant reserve powers over the Australian government and parliament. A more dramatic handover of power came with the passing of the Statute of Westminster through the British Parliament in 1931. With a stroke of the pen, Britain gave up all control over the parliaments of all the British dominions, including Australia. At the 1926 Imperial Conference, it had been agreed that the Governor-General would now act solely on the advice of the Dominion government. The Statute of Westminster removed remaining British powers to block Dominion legislation and gave full foreign policy freedom. Yet, unlike Canada, the Irish Free State and South Africa, Australia didn't adopt the Statute of Westminster straight away. We waited 11 years, until 1942. I think if there had been Labour governments in the 1930s, it's possible that it would have been ratified earlier. Not, not certain, but probable. Uh, the Conservatives running Australian governments in the 1930s, I think, uh, on the whole, were not emotionally very easy with the new scheme of things. Of rather more importance, I think, was uh, the old Australian sense of uh, defence isolation that at a time when there was already concern about Japan, the one signal they didn't want to give the world outside, and especially they didn't want to give to Tokyo, uh, was that Australia was a fully independent and therefore separate and therefore very vulnerable state. The longer they could maintain the, the language and rhetoric and appearances of empire, a large powerful empire of which Australia was merely a part, that might seem to lessen Australian dignity but it also made, they would have thought, Australia a less enticing target for would-be aggressors. In the meantime, Prime Minister Menzies had declared war on Germany in 1939 as a result of Britain's declaration of war. Menzies threw himself into Britain's struggle against the aggressor. ...to the creation of arms, has devoted herself night and day to one end, to arming herself for revenge, for hatred, 
for conquest. Those dates, 1901, 1919, 1931, 1942, are legal and political turning points. But there are more potent symbolic events along the path to independence. Events like the Battle at Gallipoli in 1915, still commemorated each year on the 25th of April. For many people, Australia's national identity was forged during that disastrous military campaign. The Japs are masters of camouflage. Quickly, our men are learning to play them at their own game. A more successful military campaign, waged alongside the United States during 1942 and 1943, has also been portrayed as an important point in Australia's coming of age. It's a grim business of man against man, kill or be killed. Certainly by 1941, Australia was exercising its independence. And it did so in dramatic fashion, with Prime Minister Curtin's declaration of war on Japan. Men and women of Australia, we are at war with Japan. For the first time in the history of the Pacific, armed conflict stalks abroad. The Pacific Ocean was reddened with the blood of Japanese victims. We are now called upon to meet the external aggressor in the gravest hour of our history. The fact that independence came gradually, that there has been no dramatic break with Britain, has helped fuel a belief that perhaps we aren't independent. The Statute of Westminster is now seen to be a confining document, not a liberating document, because all the British possessions, colonies, that became independent uh, after the Second War, notably India, of course, uh, under Attlee, and then all the Africans under Macmillan, they were not bound by the Statute of Westminster. And Papua New Guinea, which was in Papua an Australian possession, and in the old German New Guinea an Australian mandate, and then trusteeship territory, that became completely independent in 1975 under my government. But Australia was not independent at that stage. For instance, you still had appeals to the Privy Council from any state court. And uh, the state governors were appointed by the British government. Our federal system is an imperial legacy. We can be very grateful to Britain for having given us a language, having given us institutions which, if we are determined, we can adapt to our own needs, on having given us our external borders. But our federal system, which is a, a very great handicap in political and economic and diplomatic terms, is an imperial legacy. The borders between the states were fixed or adjusted by the British government. Aborigines, of course, had nothing to do with state borders in Australia. And migrants this century have nothing to do with state borders in Australia. For many people, the fact that our head of state, the Queen, is British, demonstrates clearly that we can't consider ourselves independent. Now, the monarch cannot speak for us. Uh, there may have been a time when there were uh, apparently sensible reasons for retaining the monarchy. Uh, Donald Horne is always chastising me for saying there may have been a time. To a pure Republican, there never was a time, whether in 1800, 1850, 1901, 
Uh, but in practical terms, um, the monarchy, to me, made more sense when there was a community of commercial value. In the days when we shipped nearly everything we produced to that great British industrial machine infrastructure in the north of England, southern Scotland, Belfast, and so on, when there were great woolen mills, when there were shipyards, um, when um, they took as much beef as we could produce, uh, and so on. Uh, those days are gone. Uh, Britain has oriented in an entirely different commercial direction. So it's very hard to see how the monarch can, with the best will in the world, speak on behalf of Great Britain and on behalf of Australia, New Zealand, Canada uh, and all the other so-called dominions. Republican sentiment is as old as European colonization of this country. After all, many of the first convicts had little reason to feel a sentimental attachment to the British monarchy. It is the truth that there's always been republicanism in Australia. I'm, the official fervour for the British Crown and for British loyalty had to mean that there'd be some people in the community that would dissent. Now, again, the presumption is that they would all be Irish. And in the case of uh, Dan Dennehy, um, a, an Australian politician of the 1840s, 1850s, newspaper man, lawyer, uh, his parents were Irish convicts. Then John Dunmore Lang, the founder of Presbyterianism in Australia, um, of Stormy Petrel, was always uh, dashing back to Scotland to get hordes of Scottish immigrants to come to New South Wales. And uh, on one of those trips in the eight, early 1850s, he wrote a Republican tract called Freedom and Independence for the Golden Lands of Australia. It's a remarkable text because it projects what would be the federal system. In the 1890s, the weekly magazine The Bulletin backed the nationalist cause, but Federation seemed to take the wind out of the Republican sails. Apart from a few small outbreaks, Republicanism lay dormant for decades. Oddly enough, the first stirrings of the present Republican debate came with the 1956 Olympics in Melbourne. On the International Council, presenting the gold medal to Betty Cuthbert. Distressed to find Australian athletes receiving their medals to the same anthem as their British competitors, a group of people formed the Australian Republican Party. The party fielded candidates in several elections in the early 60s, but gained only limited support. Press coverage of its efforts was unsympathetic. Donald Horn, in 1964, took up the theme in his best-selling book, The Lucky Country. Yet the Republicans remained a small minority, even while Australia was changing during the late 60s and 70s. Well, may we say, God save the Queen. Because nothing will save the Governor-General. After November 1975, when the Whitlam government was dismissed by the Governor-General, Republicans had a new fear. For them, Sir John actions seemed to show that Britain could still interfere in Australia's political system. For a brief period, unions and others on the left of Australian politics redoubled their efforts to sever the final link with Britain. Although support for a republic was still muted, public opinion was slowly changing. Australia's large immigration program, continuous since the late 1940s, was changing our cultural makeup. For a variety of reasons, our attachment to the monarchy was waning, and the growing economic importance of Asia continued a reorientation away from Britain. In July 1981, Royalty again took centre stage with the wedding of Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer. 
Two days earlier, for the first time, the Australian Labour Party incorporated the word Republic into its official party platform. In 1986, the Australia Act finally removed the remaining state legislative ties with Britain, including appeals to the Privy Council. By early 1993, some opinion polls were showing majority support for a republic. Significantly, they indicated that a growing proportion of Liberal Party voters, traditionally supporters of the monarchy, supported the republic. Formed in mid-1991, the Australian Republican movement captured media interest with its high-profile committee of writers, academics and other professionals. Monarchists responded in 1992 with the formation of Australians for Constitutional Monarchy, chaired by the former High Court Chief Justice, Sir Harry Gibbs. Our main case is that this is the system of government we have had in Australia since the Federation uh, commenced on the 1st of January uh, 1901. It's worked well. There have been almost no problems have occurred during the whole of that time. And that is uh, pretty remarkable when you look at any system of government anywhere in the world. Uh, the case would need to be very strong for us to embark on something different to the system that we have at the moment. And we don't believe that that case has been made. But I should emphasise that uh, we see this as being an Australian issue for Australians. Uh, it doesn't have to do with Australia's relationship with Britain. It's how we, as a maturing people, uh, choose to be governed for ourselves here in this country. Saying that the monarchy per se is not a terribly interesting thing to contemplate is not to say that the system of which it's part is not a vital thing to contemplate. And I'd want to make that distinction between what you might call royalty per se and the system in which encompasses uh, a, monarch, a monarch of some kind or other. Uh, we, I think, were terribly fortunate that we inherited that system. And again, we have acclimatised it. Now, it's an Australian uh, constitutional monarchy under which we uh, operate. So I don't know why we would get agitated about that and, and feel somehow that we're the victims of a takeover which has never been resolved. I don't understand why it is that uh, some people who are professed Republicans say that they have a, an identity crisis, say that they, they do not have independence. I, I frankly don't understand that. Because brought up when I was, in a time when there were still people say, talking about England as home, uh, I can't recall ever feeling that I was dependent in any way on any other country, Britain or anyone. And I, I don't think that that was a common feeling. I think what, what was common was the acknowledgement of our origins and the respect for the traditional values and the traditional institutions that we had uh, been left as a legacy. The monarchy will not survive this century in Australia. Now, people used to say that if you um, became a republic, you'd be repudiating the Commonwealth links. So that is not the case. There's a, a great majority of members of the Commonwealth are in fact republics, and there's a few other monarchies. But you, you still have, some of the polls used to fudge that issue, you would still have the Commonwealth of Nations uh, without uh, being a monarchy. Most of the members of the Commonwealth are not monarchies. And there are several monarchies which don't have our Queen as their head of state. I mean, this is no disparagement of the Queen, but I don't think anybody seriously contends that any of the Queen's children will be head of state in Australia. Why, after numerous false starts, is a republic now gaining increasing popular support? What are the broader implications for the Constitution? It's not, I think, a coincidence that we're just a hundred years on from the, uh, the steps that led to the setting up of the Commonwealth of Australia. And I think somehow there seems a kind of historical inevitability to say, just as a new nation was created out of the colonial experience, in 1901, so probably in the year 2001, 
there'll be the creation of a new kind of political structure. The opinion polls have changed. Whether public opinion is distinct from the polls has changed. That change in the polls reflects really the absence of strong debate in favour of the present constitution more than uh, necessarily a profound shift in public opinion, but who knows? The point is a number of issues that uh, were regarded as completely unthinkable and certainly not debatable a few years ago are now well and truly on the agenda. There are two reasons why I believe uh, there has been a shift. There has been a virtual absence of the anti-Republican point of view and I have no doubt also that the negative publicity surrounding certain members of the royal family has also played a part. I think there ought to be a bipartisan approach about the process that we go through. I would be a bit worried if we said, look, let's fast track it and let's make sure that we, we have a minimum change that occurs in 18 months so that in three years' time we've got a President of the Republic. I wouldn't like that much if the effect of that was simply just to change the letterhead at, at Yarralumla and wherever you had the word Governor General placed with the word President and it meant that there was no thinking through about what it is that we were trying to do and what the best result was in the medium and long term. No matter how you elect a president, you've got a problem. If he or she is chosen by popular vote, then the president feels in a more powerful position or, or a, ri a position of rival power to that of the prime minister. If it's by a two thirds vote, of the Parliament say it's the same thing. Well, I'm not sure how far we can get in changing everything, but I think that Chapter 2, which deals with the executive government and the powers of the Governor-General, that's certainly got to be changed. But there are consequential changes, too, that we have to look at. Um, uh, I think the position of the states has to be protected and preserved, because something that could bring this whole uh, process to a shuddering halt would be if you had several of the states who said, well, we intend to remain in a sort of quasi-monarchical form and we're going to have state governors who are appointed by the Queen on the recommendation of the, of the state government and we're not going to go ahead with uh, being part of a republic which has some, perhaps, p potential to reduce state power. Once you get the Constitution on the table, what do you do, for example, if at a constitutional convention people come along and say I want a guarantee of the rights of indigenous people. You're going to incorporate that? That's a big change. What does that do to land titles? What does that imply in relation to other groups in the community? Once you open this up, you have the potential for very great upheaval and change. I don't know that people want that. In a sense, what was done in the 1890s was uh, by a much less educated electorate than this one, it was really much more difficult. Now, because at that stage, the, uh, uh, the jealousy and the rivalry and the suspicion of the other states was much more acute, I think, than the, the feeling that we ought to move to a new stage of national development towards republic. I think this will be easier than it was in the 1890s. The Australian community historically has been wary of major constitutional change and uh, rightly so I mean, I would like to see us celebrate a hundred years of constitutional stability in 2001 and not have that event overshadowed by enormous division in the community it seems increasingly likely that Australia will eventually become a republic Australia has changed immeasurably since the Constitution was drawn up. The Republican debate provides the opportunity to renovate at least some parts of the political system.